Mm. It's good dinosaur spit. Yeah, yeah. This this water at one time was dinosaur spit, and yet now it's potable, drinkable water. How'd that happen? The water cycle, also known as the hydrologic cycle. That's the first subject in chapter 28 here. Chapter 28 is entitled Shaping Earth's Surface. That is the topic for module 10. So you're going to learn about, first of all, how water recycles. And you'll also learn then what water does to the Earth's surface and under the Earth's surface. The fact that water, not just water, but other, other things like wind and ice can shape the Earth's surface in a process called weathering. So you're going to learn about that kind of stuff as well. Now, as a way of teaching you about the water cycle, on the next slide, there's actually a song that I recorded a number of years ago called the Tongue Twister Weather Song. And uh, listen for the, the, I think it's the, the third verse, uh, where I actually talk about the different steps in the water cycle, evaporation, precipitation, and condensation. So that's something to look forward to. Like I said, we'll be, you know, this chapter really focuses on, on water as well as wind and ice and how all those things can affect how the earth looks over time. To be a weather boy or a weather girl, there's one thing you must learn. A meteorologist must come to terms with a lot of terms. Now rain, snow, sleet, and hail, they may seem simple to the brain, but it takes some skill to spit them out, so it's your tongue that you must train. Try the tongue twister weather song. It makes your mind and mouth more strong. So easy on the ears, you'll want to sing along. Like Peter Piper picking a peck of pickle peppers, it takes a tricky tongue to try to tie it all together. This tornado for the tonsils. The tongue twister weather song. There are lots of instruments that are used to measure weather. But to properly pronounce them's another story altogether. It's easier done than said, and easier said than sung, cause they'll be dancing in your head and twisting on your tongue. To take a typical temperature, trust your rusty old thermometer. To put a pinpoint on the pressure, you must monitor your barometer. And when you hear a pitter patter on the window pane, check your groovy pluviometer to tally up the rain. Try the tongue twister weather song, it makes your mind and mouth more strong, so easy on the ears you'll want to sing along. Words bounce around like rubber baby buggy bumpers, some tumble off the tongue and some are simply stumpers. This adventure for the dentures, the tongue twister weather song. the water that we use today it once was dinosaur spit if that takes a tinge from off your thirst try not to think of it just think about the steps it takes for water to recycle to go from spit to perrier we need our friend the water cycle the sun heats lakes and mud puddles to cause evaporation water vapor forms cloud droplets that's called condensation cloud droplets get together and it's look out folks below before you know it precipitation hits as rain hail sleet and snow it's the tongue twister weather song it makes your mind and mouth more strong so easy on the ears you'll want to sing along selling seashells by the seashore leads to prosperity the song leads to mental and dental dexterity an earthquake -ia for the trachea we'll put your epiglottis in a knot and put your uvula on the movula the tongue twist weather song Okay, so as I mentioned, the water cycle is also known as the hydrologic cycle, and it all starts with liquid water. Liquid water we can see, right? But if you heat liquid water, you can get it to the point where the water molecules are no longer in their liquid state, they actually become gaseous. They become water vapor. And water vapor is actually invisible. We can't see water vapor with our naked eye. Um, we can't see clouds. Now, don't, don't mistake clouds for being water vapor. They're not. They're actually liquid. They're tiny little liquid water droplets. So you have evaporation from the oceans. You're turning liquid water into water vapor. That water vapor then condenses and forms liquid water droplets, tiny ones that are so small, their weight is so small that they're not pulled back to the earth 
but rather through updrafts in the cloud itself, they're actually able to, to hover in the air. Eventually, though, they, they accumulate, glom onto each other, um, and become so heavy that the force of gravity pulls them back down to the ground. Precipitation. And then that's it. Those are your three steps of the water cycle. Evaporation, condensation, precipitation. So this, this graphic is a nice representation of the water cycle. The fact that the Earth is essentially a closed system. So the water that we use today has been used over and over and over and over and over and over and over again, recycled through the water cycle. One important point that's brought up in this slide is that water uh, goes through the water cycle, but sometimes it can actually stay in one part for a long time. So for example, the polar ice caps, that water is essentially locked away. It's not cycling um, very, very rapidly because it's locked in, in its solid form of ice uh, for, for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Now, in this century that you'll be living in, uh, one of the big concerns is global warming. And with global warming comes sea level rise. Now, why would the, why, why would the oceans rise? Well, partly it's because you're going to have water that's been locked up in ice caps and glaciers uh, on land will wind up in the oceans. So you'll be adding water to the oceans that uh, has been essentially locked away on land for, for years and years and years. That, however, is not the big concern. It's the fact that oceans, the ocean temperatures will be rising. And just like many substances, water, when it gets warmer, expands. It gets bigger. It's thermal expansion. And so that's why there's concern, because as the oceans get bigger, even by not changing the actual amount of water in the ocean, but when that water gets warmer, it expands, it takes more volume, and that's going to cause sea level rise, even without worrying about water, new water being added to the system. Just by warming the water that's already in the ocean basins, it will cause that water to expand and will result in sea level rise. Okay, this is a pretty straightforward skills test about the water cycles. You're going to see a graphic very similar to the one we've been looking at, and you'll also get a chance to actually watch several small video clips about the water cycle. So uh, take a look at the little videos. This is a little tutorial video which will actually step you through the whole process, but then as part of the skills test, there are several small vid videos you'll watch and answer a few quiz questions. You may recall that uh, several modules ago I talked about water and water treatment and the importance of fresh water. Water has always been a, a kind of a, a sweet spot for me. I've always enjoyed talking about water, thinking about water, and it's partly because of where I grew up. I grew up, I grew up in the middle of Podunk, Pennsylvania, and we lived on, on a, lived in a house that was on top of a, a ridge. The ridge was a limestone ridge, and our house was uh, we sat on top of this ridge, we weren't close to any civilization, so we didn't have any city water that we could tap into. So we actually used a well, we had, and, and the well was drilled about 200 feet down into Limestone Ridge into the water table. So as you're going to learn, the water table is essentially uh, where, where all, an area where all the pore spaces of the, of the ground are filled with water. Um, and there's a couple of ways that your well can can be destroyed. Uh, one way is by lightning, which happened on a couple of occasions. Because essentially what happens is you've got this well dug into the ground, and there's an electric motor at the bottom, which pumps the water up into the house. But if, you, if your well gets struck by lightning, it blows out the pump at the bottom. No water. So that means you have to pull up all the casing and replace the motor, etc. There's another way that your well can no longer work, and that's if the water table drops. So if not only you, but of course you're not, you know, the other people are using the water. There's, you know, in my case, there are farmers who are irrigating their fields with this water, with this groundwater. If that groundwater level drops below the level of your well, then you're sunk as well. You, you, you'd have to then drill deeper into the ground. Of course, that's a costly process in order to get to the groundwater. So as is mentioned in this slide, the depth of the water table does vary. It depends upon your, your precipitation, your climate. You can go through dry periods where your water table drops and drops and drops. Um, you know, it does depend on the surface topography. And if you do have uh, 
lakes and streams, ponds, that's typically an area where that's low enough that the water table is actually above the land surface. But as was mentioned, you can have, uh, it, it, you know, the amount of where your groundwater is also depends upon how who's drawing from it. So the another very famous area of groundwater is called the Ogallala Aquifer. I'm not sure if I'm spelling that correctly, but you may want to check that check into that. A lot of the uh, a lot of the Great Plains states uh, depend upon the Ogallala water for, well, aquifer for their drinking water as well as their irrigation water. In section 28.2 of your textbook, you'll notice that they make the distinction between porosity and permeability. They're very close, closely related topics, but they're not the same. Porosity is essentially uh, just how much open space there is in a soil or sediment uh, for water to be. Uh, so sandy soils uh, tend to have uh, to have a lot of open pore spaces, so they're relatively porous. Permeability is how quickly water can flow through a porous material. So that has to do uh, with how essentially the uh, the pore spaces are lined up uh, to allow for or to keep water from flowing through. Okay, so this uh, graphic just kind of underscores the importance of uh, groundwater when it comes to getting drinking water for humans as well as for animals. Uh, you, you can have surface water, ponds, that sort of thing, uh, but also groundwater is very important. Uh, now this is a, a graphic that actually I did back in 2009. I used to work for USA Today and I would make these weather graphics and this one just kind of highlighted the fact that Texas was in the midst of a drought at that point. Uh, and I got a chance to actually use the, word, the term water table in a national newspaper. So uh, the water table had, dro had dropped significantly uh, at this point. So a lot of the stock tanks, the man-made ponds uh, that farmers kind of relied for a water, as a water source for their cattle had dried up because the water table had dropped uh, below the surface. If you note on page 666, uh, there's a nice diagram there showing a perched water table. So you can actually have uh, water that is above the main water table if you have an area that is uh, has a very low permeability. So clay, unlike sand, has a very low permeability. And so you can actually drill a well into a, a perched water table uh, to provide a, a water source that is well above. If you had to actually drill into the actual main water table, <clears throat> that'd be a much deeper well. Notice that this particular uh, well has dried up because the perch water table has dropped below uh, the location of the original well. This graphic really just kind of points out uh, the importance of two things in the motion of groundwater. First of all, the permeability of the of the soil layer uh, will depend will determine uh, the motion of groundwater, but also of course gravity. Uh, the fact that we've got water essentially moving downhill. So the movement of groundwater is a result of two factors, permeability, so the more permeable the material, the faster the flow, and gravity. Water moves down the hydraulic gradient. Okay, so now we move on to section 28.3 that deals with the work of groundwater. So water, groundwater, um, can change the features of the surface uh, depending upon, let's say, how quickly the groundwater is removed from the, the water table. Uh, you can have a situation where you have land subsidence, where the actual sur land surface drops uh, because water is being removed from the ground underneath more quickly than it's being replenished. Um, so think about like a, a sponge that is full of water. And it's gonna be a certain thickness. Then let that sponge dry out and notice that it would be less thick. Why is that? Because there's no more water spaces occupying those, or there's no more water in those pore spaces. Same thing goes on with land surface. You can actually have land subsidence. A related problem is, let me change my colors here, is something called saltwater intrusion, which is actually happening in portions of Florida. Think about what Florida is. Florida is kind of a peninsula right there. And what's happening in portions of Florida is that the water, the, the, the water tables have been dropping significantly enough. Water is being drawn out of the ground for human purposes, watering lawns and, and golf courses and irrigating orange groves and, and being used for regular human needs. Uh, 
and the water table is dropping. So you're having subsidence, but you're also having saltwater intrusion because think about what Florida is. It's a peninsula. It is surrounded on all sides, well, not on two sides at least, by the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. And so what's happening is that water, salt water, is going in and replacing the fresh water that had taken up all those pore spaces. So you're really getting the worst of all scenarios in the sense that now not only are wells drying out, but they're uh, being the salt water is coming in to those wells, and uh, which makes the wells essentially useless. So that's another thing that can happen uh, as water is drawn from uh, the water table. Okay, water can also create caverns and caves because it dissolves uh, carbonates, uh, carbonate minerals in the ground, and that. It's actually a fairly common thing in this part of the country. Alabama, Mississippi, portions of Tennessee have wonderful caverns and caves as a result of this motion of water through the ground, dissolving over time, creating karst and caves. You can also have karst regions. Karst regions are essentially little sinkholes that are carved out at the uh, surface of the earth due to the action of groundwater. Now the surface water can do two different types of work. It can either do erosion, it can take away material, and it can also do dep deposition. It can deposit. Um, and the nature of its erosion ability or its de depositional uh, capability it really depends upon the, the speed of the, the water's flow. Um, and so you have what's called laminar flow, which is kind of slow and gentle. You also have turbulent flow. And the more turbulent and the more fast your flow, the more likely your water is that it can pick up larger stuff uh, and carry that larger stuff along, heavier stuff. The slower and gentler, it's going to do a little less erosion and it's going to er erode and carry smaller particles as opposed to larger particles. And one thing that's interesting about the way surface water works is that by looking at the debris from, let's say, a flood event, uh, you can get a feel for where the water was fastest because that's where the heavy stuff would be deposited. Uh, where the water perhaps wasn't as fast, you have some of the smaller uh, deposits in those locations. Now, one thing you'll see in the textbook is a drainage basin. Well, essentially, it's, it's a, of course, water always goes downhill. So um, it, you can divide the United States, the continental United States, into two halves, right? You have what's called the Continental Divide. In fact, I've been uh, to the Continental Divide, to continental divide in Colorado, uh, which meant that any rainwater that fell to the west of the Continental Divide would eventually find its way into all various tributaries, but eventually into the, would wind up in the Pacific Ocean. Whereas anything that falls on the east side of the Continental Divide would eventually wind up in the Gulf of Mexico and or the Atlantic Ocean. And certainly we recognize that uh, the water's speed is not going to be the same throughout an entire stream, like the entire length of a stream or river. The water is not going to be flowing at the same speed the entire length. And that, you know, it's all going to depend upon the local gradient, and how wide the, the, the stream channel is and all that kind of stuff. But even at one particular location in a stream, uh, you're going to have varying speeds. And so in this case, if we've got a little bend in the, in the river, uh, your fastest water is going to be on the outside out here. And that's where you're going to have erosion taking place. You're actually going to have an erosion of this outside bank, whereas the water on the inside here is going to be going slower. And that's where you're going to have more likely to have deposition and have little sandbanks uh, created. Here in the middle of the channel, kind of in the straighter section, you're going to have the fastest water flowing through the middle. And then as it gets to this bend, you're going to have the fastest water going on the outside again, seeing erosion being uh, taking place on the outside part of the bend and deposition occurring at the inside part of the bend. Now it's always historically been that some of the richest agricultural land is close to rivers. Uh, whether you think about the Nile or, or the Mississippi, um, this area in through here, these, these flood plains are actually very, very rich and that's because occasionally floods occur and 
though that can be a bad thing briefly, it also replenishes nutrients to these particular areas. So they actually are agriculturally very, very, uh, uh, very viable places to farm if you're willing to accept the fact that every once in a while you are going to have to deal with flooding. So, uh, yeah, you just kind of take your take your chances. Now, there are, of course, ways of, of protecting. That's you know, quite often you'll have uh, during your normal river channel, uh, you'll actually build le levees uh, on each side of the main river channel to prevent flooding of the larger floodplain. And of course, where a river or a stream empties into a larger body of water, the flow does slow down. As the flow slows down, sediments start to fall out of the water, and you wind up producing a delta. So, of course, the Mississippi Delta is one of the more famous of the world's delta regions.